But it means a lot to, I think, the authors who are writing to say, you know, I I'm part of a tradition that's important. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Bridge Across the Stars, a sci fi bridge original anthology. Before we get into our great interview today, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House is one of the very best editors I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Crystal offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, she's booking for March right now, so inquire early. Go ahead and send her uh, an email. She has four proofreaders on staff, uh, so she can usually accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time. Uh, she comes highly recommended by authors such as Hugh Howie and Samuel Peralt. Most of her experience is with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle grade fantasy, but, uh, you know, she's a master of all, so uh, be sure to reach out to her. Also, she's got something cool. She's uh, currently recruiting for her NetGalley co-op. Uh, authors who have new book releases or have old books, they could use some review love, can rent one, six, or 12-month slots, and put up to a book a month on NetGalley's catalog, which now has its own dedicated United Kingdom site. So uh, check out the link in the show notes uh, to Pico's House. There's an awesome new anthology out from my friend Armand Rosamilia. It's called My Favorite Story Podcast Author Anthology. Project Entertainment Network presents My Favorite Story. Fifteen podcast hosts and authors share their favorite short stories they've ever written. Stories by Christopher Golden, Brian King, James A. Moore, J. Wilburn, Chuck Buddha, Armand Rosamilia, and more. Check out this collection of stories presented by podcast hosts and authors. You're going to love this. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also, check out my friend Daniel Kenny, who writes some of the very best middle grade uh, fiction. Uh, if you're looking for the perfect gift for those younger readers, Dan is He's an amazing writer. Uh, he's been on the show before, and uh, he's hilarious. And he writes books that really grab kids' attention. Uh, he, I can't say enough wonderful things about Dan Kinney. There's a link down in the show notes. We're going to be talking more specifically about some of his books in the coming shows, but you're going to love Daniel Kinney. Go pick up some of his uh, middle grade readers for those uh, youngsters in your life. Also, Patricia Gilliam. She's one of my favorite science fiction writers. Uh, Patricia does amazing things. Um, there's a link down in the show notes where you can go visit her author page. She has a long-running series. If you're looking to get into some great new science fiction reading in the new year, you cannot go wrong with picking up some from Patricia Gilliam. As always, we have an audiobook clip at the end of the show from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, I'm really excited today to have a group of friends with me to talk about writing science fiction, one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. Uh, Jason Onspach, Rhett Bruno, Chris Porto, and the, uh, the famous or infamous uh, Kevin J. Anderson are all joining us today to talk about this phenomenal new collection uh, that has just come out from Sci Fi Bridge, and it's called Bridge Across the Stars. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you, Hank. Hey, Hank. Hey, Hank. Uh, we're going to start, uh, Jason. Why don't uh, you tell us about Sci Fi Bridge? Uh, because this collection has come out of uh, this really unique group that you guys have put together, doing phenomenal work. And if it weren't for Sci Fi Bridge, there would be uh, no Bridge Across the Stars. So tell us a little bit first off about. The uh, about Sci-Fi Bridge and what it is that you guys are doing. So Sci-Fi Bridge is a marketing collective. I think that's the best way to put it. It was the brainchild that Rhett and Chris had, and uh, then they knew I had kind of a, a mind and an interest in marketing, so they brought me into it as well. And the idea behind it is uh, several, uh, I guess, high-profile, successful, and some, uh, you know, some newer authors in the science fiction realm get together and we just work to help each other out. We have a theory that when 
one of us is doing well or 10 of us or 20 of us, we all end up doing well. And I think that that's proved itself true. So we work together and uh, put together contests. Uh, we have a sci-fi bridge mailing list that sort of curates the best in science fiction, at least that we're aware of. And readers have really responded positively to that. So part of our strategy was, well, let's start releasing some anthologies that consist of members of Sci-Fi Bridge and get more of these stories in front of readers. Because what we're finding is um, readers certainly have favorite authors, but um, they are fans of a genre or a style. They love military science fiction or they love space opera. And when they find someone that they really appreciate and then that person tells them about Sci-Fi Bridge and Sci-Fi Bridge tells them about this author who writes in the same genre, uh, they're just they're just loving it. And so we've been able to reach a lot of people and introduce a lot of readers to their new favorite authors. Cool. Um, and, and Sci-Fi Bridge really is a natural um, growth out of the, the changes that have happened in the publishing industry in the last uh, few years. Because I know that you guys are really helping uh, – helping authors connect with readers and uh you know it, it's really interesting um the the power has really shifted from the the big publicity departments that the major publishers used to have and now even it, it's it's really not even about the conversation between indie and, and traditional anymore it's about how is the author connecting with their audience uh because even traditional published authors are, are having to do a lot of their own publicity and that that machinery is not as as present anymore um so it's really it's really cool that uh, that you guys have collected these people and and are helping them to connect with a new audience and to share audiences mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and uh and and this latest collection is just uh, just an outbranch of that we, we knew we wanted to market this is our first original anthology so we knew we really wanted to market that to readers and it was really easy and uh, because all i did was say uh, get the biggest names possible. And obviously they did that. <laughs> and, and then I said, wait, 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 you know, throw me in too. And, and so they did that. Um, and you know, it, it, already it's, it's just showing great. It's getting a great reception. That's awesome. Um, I've been reading, uh, let's see, I guess uh, Chris sent me a copy of it. Uh, was it Saturday? Uh, sometime this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime. Yeah. And, and I started reading it and, uh, I think it was a couple hours later. I, I emailed him back and I said, man, this collection is phenomenal. It's really, really great. And, uh, it begins with this really incredible forward by Kevin J. Anderson. And we're going to talk to him about that in just a minute. Um, but, uh, but Chris and Rhett, you guys really, um, have, have kind of headed up the, uh, you know, the, the gathering of the stories and the editing. Um, whose whose idea was it initially? <laughs> uh, probably Rhett's. Uh, you know, like he's like he mentioned, like Jason mentioned, I think, or someone mentioned, we published three anthologies before, but they were they were uh, repubs of stories that were already out there, and so this is the first original anthology, and I think. I think collectively, but probably came from Rhett because most of the good ideas for Sci-Fi Bridge come from <laughs> Rhett. Um, I think I think we all had the idea, and and Chris and everyone were like, "Well, this is going to be a ton of work," and I kind of forced them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's a but, smooth talker, that Rhett. <laughs> but yeah, that's at, accurate. At, at least as far as this one goes, we I mean we started this Sci-Fi Bridge. I think started about nine months ago, and we started this about nine months ago. And yeah, was, I, Rhett, I'll correct you because we're almost to our one year anniversary. It was oh, February okay. of 2017. So, so yeah, we're almost, so, we're almost a year old. So we've been working on this for a while now. And the interesting part about this one is like, now we've worked with a ton of authors. We've done giveaways with them. So we know others, but when we started this, I mean, I, I was just cold emailing authors. I didn't even know asking them if they wanted to be a part of this all original anthology to, you know, kind of help put sci-fi bridge on the map. So it was a, Amazing that we were able to get the level of authors that are in this collection. Wow. Um, have you been surprised uh, by the the kind of buy-in uh, from authors that you've gotten over this last year and how easily uh, you guys have, have been able to build this uh, to, to the size that it is uh, really as quickly as you have? Um, I mean, I, I think definitely as far as when, I mean, when we started this, we were just emailing people with this idea and, you know, they weren't getting anything out of it at first. And now, I mean, I'm dealing and I'm helping out authors that are way more famous than I am, you know, <laughs> so it just kind of now. Yeah, for now. now, obviously. But 
you know, it's just grown really fast. And to have like emails in my inbox from these authors who have sold a million copies asking us if they'll help with the law, la- if we'll help with the launch or if I'll read their book and even sometimes asking me for a blurb, you know, it's been pretty cool since we started this. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, so, uh, Chris, you, you did, uh, the, the lion's share of the editing, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is it about editing that you love? Oh, oh man. Other than you're a sadist. <laughs> Other than I'm a sadist. Yeah. Sadist <laughs> yeah. with a red pen. Um, no, you know, I, actually I'm, I'm working on a novel with uh, one of the other authors in the collection named David Bruns. Um, and, Never and heard of him. no, I know <laughs> who has really, <laughs> right. uh, but anyway, but seriously, um, you know, he he did a first really good refined draft of the novel, and he said, you know, I really I'm, r- refining stuff just isn't what I'm interested in. I'm, I want to get that first, you know, image down on the page. I want to get that plot, you know, out on the page. And I'm finding that I'm enjoying um, revising and suggesting, uh, you know, a different direction or, or fleshing out characters to this novel that's, you know, initially it was sort of his novel and I was going to edit it. And now it's sort of turned into a jointly written novel because of what I've done to it. And, and we, we play to our strengths that way. And so to go back to your question about editing, you know, that's part of what I do with editing. I mean, I try to give the whole spectrum, which is, you know, fix from the basics of fixing typos and grammar and making sure, you know, sentences are, are correct and all that, but also say, you know, well, you had this guy in, at the, in the first chapter say X and here he's saying why, and it's almost exactly the opposite, and it doesn't really jibe with his character, you know, or, or just making sure you're aware of that. And there's, yeah, I know, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Or, oh, you know what, you're right, that's going to confuse the reader, we need to fix this. So I, I like refining and, and reshaping things along with the author sort of as kind of a partner in the process. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Chris, I'm into the same stuff, which is why when a lot of these stories went through both of us, <laughs> so, you know, they, they were kind of picked apart because we both really like looking for that detail. I do the same thing with my co-author where I, he'll write really fast and I'll go in and kind of developmental edit it to use a kind word until, you know, it works for both of us. Um, how did you guys kind of split up the duties of, of kind of co-editing uh, some of these stories? Um, well, I, I basically said to Rhett, look, if, if I'm going to be the editor on this, I want to sort of have the final word because I'm a control freak like that. But no. in a, yeah, I know <laughs> you've never worked with me before, so you don't know, Hank, <laughs> right. on two different anthologies. Um, <laughs> But uh, but there were a couple of stories where it made more sense for him to take the lead. And, and it also relieved the, the workload on me a little bit so we could kind of parallel process what we were doing. And it wouldn't have to bottleneck with me day after day. So it I did most of it, but but he did some of it himself. And then we, we kind of tag teamed on a couple of things like he mentioned. Yeah. Um, so who are who are some of the authors uh, that are included in this collection? Uh, well, uh, Lindsay Baroker, um, who wrote, uh, um, uh, who's written a lot of, uh, very, uh, popular sci-fi, um, Maya Bono, who wrote a Star Wars novel, uh, David Van Dyke, who has a popular series, uh, Rhett, you probably know better than I do. I mean, you were the recruiter, really. Yeah. Um, there's Will McIntosh, who's another, he's a traditional author who's been around. Patty Jansen, she's the hybrid author. She's done a bunch. Josie Russell, she's a traditional author who's kind of just getting started. So it's a nice, basically we wanted a nice variety of authors from all sorts of different different backgrounds, which is a big part of Sci-Fi Bridge too. We don't just, you know, promote indie authors. We don't just promote traditional authors. We try to do a little bit of both kind of mi- merge fan bases because they are very different fan bases. And that was the goal here to have Someone like Kevin J. Anderson writing the forward that have a big time indie author like Craig Martell, you know, it's kind of a variety that you don't see in a lot of collections. And uh, the I really love the the um, the mix of authors that you got. Uh, it's it's really <clears throat> great, uh, not only of genre and kind of subgenre, uh, but like you said, some traditional, some some indie, a really great mix. Um, how long did it take to gather this group of authors together? Um, I could look through my emails, but I think we got probably like 10 people right away when we were starting Sci-Fi Bridge and then slowly added more because we wanted a bit more variety. We wanted a few more stories. And basically we just, you know, we told them the premise. We wanted these stories about the wonders of space, exploration, aliens, that 
that kind of stuff, like space opera kind of stuff. And we told them to go with that. And the variety of stories people came up with that fit into that subgenre, subgenre is just, it's just really cool. That's amazing. Uh, and like we mentioned earlier, The Ford is written by Kevin J. Anderson. And, you know, every great collection needs uh, a great Ford to really set the tone for it. Um, whose idea was it to get Mr. Anderson uh, on board? <laughs> so I had sent an email out to everyone in, in the group. Like, so guys, like we all probably know people who would be, you know, who's someone we could aim for at the top to do a forward, like someone unrealistic. And it was Maya Bonhoff who said, oh, well, I, I know Kevin, if you want to give him a try. And obviously none of us thought he would do it, but <laughs> I emailed him and asked if he would. And Kevin answered right away, which was awesome. And he said he, he wasn't sure he would think about it. And if I'm remembering correctly, the next morning I woke up to an email saying he woke up early and just decided to do it, <laughs> which was which was pretty awesome. Hey, ten, 10 bucks is 10 bucks, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, Kevin J. Anderson is on the call with us today. Um, I, I want to tell you, uh, Kevin, I've, I've been a, a big fan of your work. And when I opened up the collection and read your uh, your introduction, uh, it, it really uh, – the, the forward that you wrote, it, it really – uh, got me fired up to read this. I, I've been going back and kind of one of my goals for this year is to go back and read a lot of the uh, early science fiction and, and fantasy that really made me fall in love with reading. Uh, and, and I've been going back and revisiting Asimov and Bradbury and Clark and uh, a lot of those. And when I read your forward, you talk about that and uh, about these early experiences you had with reading and and how it really opened up a whole world uh to you uh first off welcome uh to the call with us but tell us a little bit about uh, about what you're writing about and about what science fiction has meant to you well see this reading short stories is kind of how i got uh into being a big science fiction fan i was watching I mean, I'm going to take us way back. I grew up as this little kid in a small town in Wisconsin, and and uh, we were between Milwaukee and Chicago and barely got either TV stations. But on Saturday afternoons, the Chicago Channel had uh, sci-fi cinema on where they played the old, like, really bad rubber monster science fiction <laughs> movies. Uh, and, and if you got the our, classics, if you got our TV antenna turned just right, we could pick up the the Chicago station and I would sit there watching like this fuzzy static filled picture of, of uh, attack of the giant leeches and stuff like that, which has greatly inspired me as a, as a writer. Um, I, I know I'm, many of your people are going, what's a TV antenna and what do you mean you don't get them? <laughs> and you know, we, we had to walk to school uphill both ways through snow and, and all that stuff. But, uh, but anyway, I, I loved reading just, uh, I mean, some, like one of my uncles gave me a, some old, like analog magazines and, and uh, I'm trying to forget. I mean, there were some old pulp magazines that, you know, the, the monsters on in the craters in the moon kind of things. And I read a lot of these stories when I was just this little kid and it really affected me, but I, I always wanted to tell stories. I made up my mind when I was five that I wanted to be a science fiction writer, but when you're when you're a kid, you don't really know the difference between a short story or a novelette or a novella or a novel or or you just read what somebody puts in front of you, especially if there's a monster on the cover of it. And so I got like these H.G. Wells books, The War of the Worlds and The Time Machine, which you think of as novels, but they're really not much more than novellas. I think they're about 40,000 words long or something like that. There's not not much to them. And I read those and then I got like these classic, and I think I talk about this in the foreword, these classic big fat collections like the, the giant book of science fiction stories that were full of, of old classics that were taken from pulp magazines, astounding stories and amazing stories and things. And, and I just ate that stuff up and I read them and then I would sit down at my dad's typewriter, which again, you might know, know what a typewriter is. It's like a steampunk version of a laptop. <laughs> um, and and I would be plunking out my own stories, and I and when I was eleven years old, I sent my first one out to a magazine, and it promptly got rejected. But I I kept writing them. But I for a long time had gotten 
away from writing short stories. I've published about a hundred of them or 150 of them all over the place. But I, in the last four or five years, I've kind of stopped because I'm writing four or five novels a year. And, and you know, a novel is a big substantial thing and you sell it separately and publishers pay you for it. And short stories just never really paid much. And unless you could figure out how to get a short story done, start to finish in a day, it wasn't really financially worth it. You might get 300 bucks for a story at analog or something, but you know, $300 for a week's worth of work is not going to pay very many people's bills. So I kind of stopped doing them except as, as favors here and there. But now as, as these guys were mentioning earlier, the whole publishing world has changed so entirely. And, and now, uh, yeah, I, I'm really established as a traditional author, but I run my own indie press. I've published over 300 books from 95 authors, and I've got uh, a whole bunch of my backlist that I put up on my own things. And I'm doing short story anthologies, and I'm writing new stories. And I've, I've got it into my mind now how I can write a story and actually get it done in a day, which means that it's worth doing. And I started writing more and more short stories, especially in my, I have this really great humorous horror detective series called Dan Shamble Zombie P.I. And I just published our sixth novel, but I write stories all the time. Um, anytime somebody asks me for a story for an anthology, I figure out how I can do a Dan Shamble story. Um, I just have one out in a brand new Jonathan Mayberry anthology because then I can put them together as another collection of short stories and sell that. And finally, to, to kind of get around to, to this anthology and how basically I kept wanting to say no to this annoying request for a foreword or something. <laughs> um, I, I've been getting to the point where I'm really using every nanosecond I can to get more writing done. And what I do all the time is I use a, a digital recorder. I'll go out hiking, I'll go out mountain climbing, and I have the recorder and I just dictate my fiction. That's how I've done it for years and years. But now I'm realizing that every time I get in the car, when I when I drive for a half an hour, well, that's enough time to write a chapter or a scene or something. So I'm I'm to the point where I, I will write a short story when I'm I I have a cabin up in the mountains that's about an hour and a half away. So I'll get a half a story done on the drive up and then the other half of the story done on the drive back. And I was at um, I was at a master class for high level authors and indie authors up on the Oregon coast, where Lindsay Burroker was also also there as one of the students, but so was Joanna Penn from the Creative Pen, and it was run by Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush from WMG Publishing. So we were like all high powered indie authors or or um, hybrid authors. And they were hammering for, this was six days, and, and they were hammering for two or three days that you have to get writing done every possible minute that you need to do. And then Maya Bonhoff writes me to say, can you write the forward for this thing? And I, mm -hmm. I went, I don't have any time to do that. And then Rhett writes me sort of this kind of pathetic, groveling, pleading thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's great at. And, and offered to buy a beer or something like that. And then I realized that every every single morning before the classes start, I would get in the car and it was like a 10 minute drive to go down to Starbucks to pick up coffee for me and my wife, Rebecca, and then drive back. And I went, well, if he only wants a thousand word forward or something like that, I can do that on my drive to Starbucks in the morning. So I did it the next morning. I drove to Starbucks and I, I dictated the whole forward to this thing because I have plenty to say about writing short fiction. And then during our lunch break that day, I went back to my room and I transcribed the the thing, and then I mailed it off to Rhett that afternoon. So, your your timing was very serendipitous, and I I was in this mindset of I have to use even my ten minute drive to Starbucks in the morning to do something useful. So you were the useful thing that I did. That. <laughs> yeah, um, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I remember because I we were like, yeah, so it probably won't happen. And we were trying to think of other authors. I even like talked to one that I knew and was like, yeah, you could do it. And then I had to tell him, uh, no, we got someone else <laughs> because I just woke up and there was a forward right in my inbox. <laughs> I love that. I love that story. Oh, it, well, but see, 
that 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 goes back to though people always ask you know how do you find so much time to write and they go well nobody gives you the, the time to write and if you if you look at the you know 10 minutes here and 20 minutes there and it's a whole different mindset from the um, like the college professor, you have to sit there for a month and wait for the muse to whisper a metaphor in your ear and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And here's one of the things. I've published over 140 books in my, my writing career and 150 short stories or so. And going to this master class with a room full of like really active uh, indie authors like like Lindsay, and I'm listening to all these people and I, I kind of would would – would shuff back to my room going, boy, am I a, I a slaggard. I don't get enough stuff done. I, <laughs> all of these th- I mean, everybody in this room is going, well, I wrote 12, 12 books last year and I hope to do better this year. And, and it is just like, we're back in the pulp days where, where you got paid a quarter cent a word and you just had to bang out story after story, after story, after story. And here's the important thing. You have to learn how to be good the first time out. You, you don't get to spend 12 drafts polishing your thing up because it's not – there's no time for that. There's other books to be written. Right. So there. <laughs> well, there's a uh, – we're at a really interesting time uh, like you have uh, – like you just described, uh, Kevin, where uh, kind of all of the rules have been uh, – it, it, at the very least, relaxed. Uh, we we don't have to go through the typical gatekeepers. We, we've heard that that talk, you know, over and over for the last few years. And and the power is in the the hands of the uh, uh, of the the writers and the publishers. Uh, but then that means that you have to sit down and do the work. And and uh, you know, when there's no rules, that means, like you said, we're right back in the pulp days where you know you're cranking out work. Um, do you think that? Uh, that we're coming back around to a time where short fiction is going to make uh, the kind of resurgence that maybe it was in, uh, you know, uh, 40, 50 years ago, where it, it really was a viable thing uh, to pursue? In, or is it, uh, do you think short fiction uh, for, for a writer is, uh, is going to be like it has been, where just things that we sprinkle in uh, between novels, uh, I guess what I'm asking is like uh, folks like Ray Bradbury, who were very prolific short story writers and really made a career of writing short stories sprinkled with a few novels. Uh, do you think that there is a place for the short uh, story writer anymore as a, as a main profession? I think it should be one of the tools in your toolkit. In fact, with with people publishing as as indie writers going on, you know, posting them as ebooks and whatever. Um, I mean, they're they're mostly doing them as ebooks. I, don't, I think print is less and less important for most of our careers now. I think it used to be there's a discrete market for a short story and a discrete market for a novel and a discrete market for a novel, and now it's just a plain continuous spectrum. I think. Uh, I mean, uh, I I have the disadvantage of having just become well known and very well skilled at writing gigantic doorstop novels. Well, they aren't as useful anymore. I mean, really, uh, like a sixty or seventy thousand word novel is about the sweet spot. I just delivered one two years ago that was a eighty thousand words long. <laughs> that, but see, that's the 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 Robert Jordan, the Terry Goodkind, the George R. R. Martin. The that's the stuff I like to write. These gigantic books with thirty different main characters and and all over the place, building to this huge epic. And people used to buy them because I think they felt they were getting a deal by by weight instead of by pay or something like that. But now, if you look at an ebook of a Brandon Sanderson novel, or you look at an ebook of a a fantasy novella that's that's you know twenty thousand words long, they look the same on the on Amazon. Whereas in the store, it looked like you were getting this gigantic tome that you wanted to read, a Shogun or or something like that. And right now, I'm kind of retooling. I have this giant series called The Saga of Seven Suns, science fiction epics. It's like Game of Thrones with planets, seven books long. And unlike Game of Thrones, I actually fished mine and turned them in. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. So wait, if you're listening, there's source material that you mine and you know about making it up. Right. Well, but so what I was thinking of doing another series in that universe, and I, I thought, I'm just going to reprogram my mind that instead of doing 180,000 word books, I will just do a series of 
whatever, 60,000 word books that tell the same story. They're just broken in different places and I can release them every two or three months. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that's, I'm flexible enough to do that, but there are a lot of colleagues that, that started publishing what I did are still in the mindset of uh, like the old way. And uh, I kind of missed those days because I knew what I was doing then. I don't know what I'm doing anymore, but um, oh well, I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I think everybody on this call has has written uh, both novels and short stories. Um, there's a, a different um, a different process for writing one over the other. Uh, but what do you think it is about science fiction in particular that really lends itself to the uh, the short story medium? And uh, and why do you think sh uh, science fiction in particular has such a uh, a market still for sh uh, for short fiction. Um, uh, Kevin, what do you think? Well, a lot of science fiction was based on this really cool idea or with a twist ending, and you can't really do that at a novel length very easily, that here's, here's an idea, and then you explore it, and you go with it. And there were science fiction magazines, so you would write science fiction stories because in the forest thrilling wonder stories and, and air combat stories and all kinds of things where you could – knock out short stories and get paid for them. Um, science fiction has has always been kind of the short form as well as the novel form. But you don't you do see mystery short stories, but not nearly as much. Um, I don't even know if there's a romance short story market. There probably is, but you think romance novels instead of romance short stories, although we used to have the like the romance pulp magazines, the, the true story and true romance, all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know. I'm, I came from reading them in the house when it was an age and I wanted to imitate a little bit. Um, let, let me throw it back to uh, the other guys since they just did the anthology. What, what do you think science fiction stories are, why it's so effective? I mean, I think concept in science fiction is kind of a real big thing and the ability to tie it into real events or you know, just extrapolate to the future. And that almost, you know, they could almost be studies of little concepts in the future. And I, I mean, I also think big thing that has to do with it is so many of these science fiction short stories, the movies we're watching today, people don't realize it. The market just for science fiction short stories has always been there because people might see a cool concept like Minority Report, which the story is totally different from the movie. And they're able to take concept, coin it, or make it into a movie because I, whereas the longer novels in science fiction usually trend towards the more epic Star Wars -y, space opera kind of stuff when it's short you know you just focus in on this cool futurist concept a future setting that you could be in future could be in and you just write a quick little story about it and those concepts often become these huge movies and people almost don't even realize that well, and I, th I think I was going to say, just to add to what Rhett was saying and, and Kevin was saying, uh, more generally, I think the, the short story is seeing a renaissance now. We've talked about this before, you know, as, as our attention span gets shorter, um, it's it's easy to dive into a short story, <clears throat> you know, for me, instead of having to, to uh, for about a weekend to finish a novel. And so, you know, when we're all sharing our, our um, limited uh, attention spans between Amazon and Netflix and everything else, it's easy to pop in a short story every once in a while. And and moreover, if you look at some of the, the reviews, like for, particularly on Bridge, several of the reviewers are mentioning that, hey, this gives me a chance to dabble with, in this case, 17 authors I might not be familiar with. I bought it because Peggy Jansen's story is in here. I'm a fan of hers. But hey, there are 60 authors that, hey, about half of them I think I like, so I'm going to go check them out some more. So it, it, it pays pays out both the authors in the sense that they get to sort of leverage the uh, 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 popularity and reach other anthology and maybe pick up some readers of their own. But for the reader, it gives them, you know, in this case, 17 windows that they can uh, they can look into a particular genre to see. So, Yeah, I think that's a, a big thing today as far as – I don't know if you can make a living writing short stories like you might have used to be able to do unless you land a movie deal off one, but as a way to get exposure – to just be in collections like these and you know even if you gain a few more fans it's so easy now to publish these collections or even to publish a short story on your own that you might not make a lot of money but it might be a way to drive people towards your books or to gain some new fans yeah 
Well, and, and if you're thinking about it, you know, I was uh, thinking about this earlier. If a writer uh, is is planning to spend um, a, a certain amount of months writing a novel, uh, or if he could do like Kevin has done and and gotten his short story writing down to a to an art and a science, and can uh, can write a series of shorts uh, in the same amount of time and publish a collection in the same amount of time or, or quicker than you could a novel, um, you know, that may become uh you know a, maybe a trend that we see in the future as as it becomes easier to collect those and publish them i don't know it, it's a it's a great time to to experiment and try things i think well let's look at the synergy though because if you are most of us who are doing this end up writing at least one series because it's just not the time for writing standalone novels that have no connection to anything else right, right? right. You know, right. many many readers bitch about that but I'm sorry that if you look at a New York Times bestseller list, when there is there is just no science fiction book on the bestseller list that is not part of some series or fantasy book. That that's yeah. the way readers want. They want to binge watch. They want to read a series. They don't just want to read um, a book and and then go. So what I'm bringing up is um, it's part of the overall canvas that you can do synergy. That as you're writing novels in your um, Chronicles of the of the moon fart legacy or whatever you want to do. Oh, I didn't know you read my work. That's yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. <laughs> you, What's all that green cheese? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You write the novel, but then you also write a short story that you do as a as a giveaway, so that maybe people will be intrigued by the character or a setup or or some sort of spin off thing that uh, is a story that didn't really fit into the overall. Story novel but you still wanted to do that adventure so you you write that and then you just start tying them all together and i i really have been paying attention to this because i just sold a, a three book epic fantasy series to tour books as traditional publisher and they they have an option on the next book but i had to very specifically put into the contract that anything that was under novel length I could still publish myself, which means I can write like 40,000 word novellas that are a side story in this and publish it myself and kind of ride on their publicity as they release the book so I can sell a bunch of ebooks of my prequel novella or something like that. And then I'm promoting the prequel novella. I mean, I might even be giving it away in story bundles or all kinds of different places so they'll read that prequel novella and want to read the other series that I actually get royalties on. So that's just another tool that we didn't used to have, because if you would publish a story in analog that was connected to your series, people would read it, but they wouldn't necessarily run out and buy the book because they didn't see the connection, because the people that read short stories in a magazine are different from the people that go to the airport and buy a science fiction paperback. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's cool to have the the clout to make tour do something like that. <laughs> well, you're, you're putting the wrong word in there because this just isn't anything that they thought about. It's not I, like I was I was like battering them into submission. It was like, well, of course you can write something that's under novel length, and I'm going, yes, but you don't understand what that means. If I well, I shouldn't say it that way. But that I mean, I'm sure they understand that. But the the whole I could write an entire series that is forty thousand word novellas that would be one after another after another that tell like a serial story. That's another adventure in that uh, in that universe. And and I now I love I love Tor books. They published all of my Dune books and all of my Seven Sons books, and they just bought this Spine of the Dragon trilogy, and they've they bought a tech high tech thriller from me, so I'm not at all being being uh, nasty about Tor. But you do know that there are a lot of problems with indie authors now, or or hybrid authors who are trying to get their rights back from the publishers that won't uh, let them go. I know several big name authors who have written like major best selling series and they want to do their own thing, but the publisher will not give them their rights back. And so think about a worse – let's let's not say it's Tor. Let's say it, it's random big publisher. Some Well, I don't want to say random because then you'll think I'm talking about random. <laughs> 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 
say say there's look at this scenario. So I sell this big trilogy to random big publisher and turns out I don't like working with them. They didn't sell very well, but they don't want to release the rights and they're stuck in that I can't write more books in that series because they own the rights to the other ones. <laughs> By putting in the contract that anything that's 40,000 words and under, I can publish my own stuff. Well, then I can just write my next book as three or four 40,000 word connected novellas instead of one 160,000 word doorstop novel. And therefore I have the rights to do that. So, Kevin, I have a question for you. How would the concept of an omnibus work within that contract framework? In other words, could you collect those three into one omnibus, or would that constitute a novel-length work of the same content, copyright content? Sort of depends on what the, what the contract was written, but there are often, and this is what I just learned at this, this workshop, there are often um, loopholes in that, they will let you have omnibus rights where you could collect things together. Um, but in fact, my I just sort of got a backdoor rights back with my uh, Dan Shamble Zombie PI series, which is was published by a traditional publisher, the first four novels. And I've basically taken them all back with Wordfire Press and written new ones. But book three and book four in the series, they still have the rights to and they won't release them. Mm -hmm. So it's a little tough for me to have book one, book two, a story collection, and book five and book six. Mm -hmm. right. I, have a, I have a similar situation with Random House right now, actually, with a novella and a book three that I own, and then they own book one and book two. Okay, but here's, here's the, the interesting thing, uh, and this came out of the workshop that we just had. They... Um, the, the people at the workshop, Dean Wesley Smith, said, look in your contract. Do they give you, do they retain omnibus rights or not? And I went back and looked and it said that, that I could request omnibus rights if I wanted to and they couldn't unreasonably deny them or something. So I just wrote the publisher. Remember, it's book three and book four that I want to get back. <laughs> and they're each like 60,000 words long, so they're short, short novels. And so they won't give me the rights back to book three and book four, but I just wrote to say, will you allow me to publish an omnibus of book three and book four as is in, in the clause number four or whatever here? And it took them two days to say, sure, we don't care about that. So now I've published the omnibus. I have book one, book two, a short story collection, an omnibus of book three and book four, and then book five and book six. So I have them all now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I might email you about that later. <laughs> that's, 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 I hope you've got that ret flag set up in your email. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds pretty intriguing. Yeah, no, I no, I, I, I want to, I want to be clear though that they're, they're not being malicious and holding the rights back. They're just doing them, doing the. Well, according to our red tape, we don't allow them to go back into uh, while we still have a hundred copies in the warehouse. Or, uh, I mean, it, it's a there. Nobody's like maliciously holding on to the series that they don't want to sell, but I still can't publish them myself unless I get the clearance. And this was an end run so that I could get the clearance, and I got it taken care of. So, and that came with a suggestion from uh, some of the other people at this workshop. So it's very good. Well, I think that's indicative of the difference in the the publishing and the the business model of the the big traditional publishers and kind of the indie mindset is that they they're really only interested in a narrow uh, certain uh, group of products and anything that goes outside of that narrow group of products is just out of their it's just not even on their radar and uh, and that that's where indies or hybrid uh, authors really have the power because they they're nimble enough to to think about those things and to put together you know interesting collections that that get around uh what the the cookie cutter mold that the other folks are worried about well and there's actually two different there's two different ways there are some publishers that well there's a couple of different more than that there are some publishers who still think that indie publishing is kind of this cute little craft that some authors do and it's kind of like <laughs> knitting potholders or something like that and they still don't quite realize what it is 
there are other publishers that are terrified and they don't want to release any rights whatsoever because it might be worth something someday. I had one uh, that we published at Wordfire Press, um, a guy wrote a techno thriller about the president's plane being shot down and being held by terrorists in the Philippine Islands. Well, this was written and published in 1986. To Ronald Wren and I mean it, it is utterly out of date. There's no reason why anybody would want to read this book. Um, but he wanted to take it and update it, change made it, make it all polished up so that it was the story is still a good story, but all of the cultural references, the president, the everybody else that he's talking about in this book are utterly irrelevant. I mean, do you want to read about right now, do you want to read a story about Vice President Dan Quayle in 1985. <laughs> I'm making up the, the year, so don't, don't come at me. Of course you don't. It's not relevant to anything. And I, he wanted to rewrite it and update it so that it was the same story, but it was relevant. And so we went to, and it's been out of print from the publisher, and I will name them as Pocket Books. It was out of print from Pocket Books forever. I mean, nobody's reading this book anymore. It's been from 1986. <clears throat> But the problem was is that the author never actually sent the letter saying, can I have my rights back? This is out of print. And so now they are one of the publishers that won't let anything go at all. Their company policy is we got the rights and we're never letting them go, even if we never publish them. And so um, I, we wrote them and said, can we have the rights back? And they said, no. And so we pushed the contract and said, um, how do... According to the contract, you have to have this book in print or we can request the rights back. And so within, and they had like three months, and in three months, they scanned it and sent us a print-on-demand copy of the book. Hmm. Proof hmm. they had it in print. Nobody's going to buy this book. It, really and truly, nobody will buy this book because it's 1986 techno thriller. And... Hmm. But they just did it because they wouldn't get rid of the rights. And so now he is not allowed to update it and publish it I mean, unless he like really changed it and pretended it was a brand new book. But uh, that was just very frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as a – yeah, uh, that, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. Well, well let's talk about – Let's talk about writing uh, short fiction here for for just a minute. Um, uh, it, all, all of us have written uh, short stories and uh, and and have uh, participated in anthologies like this, and we see some really really cool stuff that comes out when when we put collections like this together. And uh, what I've found as a writer is that writing a short story, especially one that uh, it is a themed anthology. It really lets me think outside what I would normally think about and, and shift gears entirely. Uh, and I, I would like to get you guys' um, thoughts on that. Um, uh, Jason, you mm -hmm. are currently publishing uh, this enormous uh, hit of a series with Nick Cole, uh, Galaxy's Edge, and I am absolutely loving it. You guys know I'm a huge fan yeah. of what you're doing. Thank you. Um, it, well, well, thank you for writing it. Um, you're but welcome. What? <laughs> Congratulations on the new baby too. I forgot to mention. Oh yeah, yeah she's you're, awesome. You're, you like, got like busy yeah, enough. right. So that's thirteen kids for you guys now. That's it's, amazing. It's close. I broke into the indie world, being like, I'm going to be like Hank Garner with all these kids, and then I have more, <laughs> and that'll be my thing, like Hank Garner with more. Are, are, aren't you, know, you dedicated gonna... to writing as num as many books as you've had kids? That's the that's the deal. Each time <laughs> right. I write a book, my wife says, "New kid." So right. Well, I've got to support. I've got to go talk to. I've got to go talk to Dawn in a minute because we can't let Jason uh, outdo us. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but how do how do you approach? Uh, because you you are involved in this big series that you and Nick are doing this big sprawling, uh, you know, continuing series. When you get to step away from that and write something short uh, and kind of outside of that, how do you approach it? And uh, what do you get out of writing short fiction? Yeah. So. Kevin actually uh, did a good job talking about it being a tool in your toolbox. I, I see these short story opportunities as a window to try something a little bit different. And so what I've done for the last several is I've said, I want to just write something that's very funny. Like it obviously has to fit the, uh, the genre, right? But 
I want to write something really funny. Like my, my artistic goal is to say, is it possible to have like the naked gun in print? Like, can you sit and read a book and just laugh and laugh and laugh as if you're watching a Mel Brooks movie? Those so are that's my kind of shamble books. Oh, okay. Well, never <laughs> mind. I guess I'm giving it up. So <laughs> it's already been done. No. Um, so, so that's what I wanted to do with, with this one. But, but every book, every short story I've written, whether it was Ledgetown, which was really kind of a dark Western, um, or this most recent one, which th the name is really too long to recite. I don't even know what it's called. That's it's why I just name. put dot, 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 space pirates in the list. Yeah, right. Yeah, that works out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's, that's the beauty as, as an artist or as a writer is, is you have this opportunity to do something and not get so bogged down that it cuts into your productivity or, you know, frankly, it cuts into your bottom line. Because there is a part of you when you hit a certain level of success where you say, well, if, if these 10,000 words or however long it is were 10,000 words of the next book in my series, it would be making this much money this quickly. So I look at it as a great opportunity to try something new and just develop different skill sets. And so maybe um, maybe you're great at pathos, but you're you're really bad at drama. Well, you know, that's your opportunity to really try to do some solid drama. Um, and so that's how I approach short stories. Um, and then from a marketing perspective, I have added thousands of people to our Galaxy's Edge newsletter, our newsletter and to my personal newsletter by having a short story that's just exclusive. Like you can't go buy it in a store. It's not in a collection. You just put it out there and you say, here's a short story. It's part of this universe and you can get it by signing up for our newsletter. And thousands upon thousands of people have done that. So there's, there's tremendous value from a marketing perspective, from an artistic perspective. Um, even if financially it's not there, uh, I think they're worth your while. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Rhett, uh, do you approach the short story differently than you do uh, maybe one of your Titan uh, novels? Um, so I'm not really a big short story writer. I do it occasionally, and I, I probably have finished like five or six. And usually I wind up trying to tie them into my series, even if it's like a totally different time period. Just something to tie it in a little bit because – Obviously, I know series are what sells now, but I do prefer standalones. I would rather write them. I'd rather read them, but it's not really a possible thing. So I sort of approach my short stories as this is a short standalone thing. And I usually kind of push the envelope because I tend, unlike Jason, who likes to write a little bit more with humorous, my stuff tends to be more dramatic, a little bit depressing, usually set in really, really dark worlds. And I kind of try to push that as far as I can in my short stories at, to the point where like even probably my most well-known story, This Long Vigil, is mostly people that have read it comment, oh, I love this, but it was like the most depressing thing ever because, it, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of pushed the envelope and I knew that. I had tried to sell it and a couple places were interested, but I had a feeling. I was like, no one's going to buy this because it really is, you know, it's it's gloomy and I think it's a good story, but you know, it's not very uplifting. It's kind of something you'd read and probably not want to read again. And so that's how I just try to approach my short stories to maybe be a place where I could write something that I know wouldn't be a big seller. But maybe some angst that you need to get out of you, and that's a great vehicle for that. Yeah, I mean, there was a period where I just wanted to try writing them, so I just wrote like four in a row, <laughs> and that was I've I'm still using them in anthologies and selling them because I wrote so many in in a row at a certain point. Yeah. And you get those out, and you're like, okay, I've done that. I can move on now and do something. Yep. Else. <laughs> Oh, Chris, uh, you and I have talked at great length about uh, our love of Twilight Zone mm -hmm. and uh, kind of uh, anthology type. Episodic storytelling. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, when I uh, approach a short story, especially when I'm writing for a collection, I, I tend to kind of think that way. Like, uh, like if this was going to be an episode of Twilight Zone, like how could I shape this uh, so that it, it feels like that kind of compact uh single sitting reading and uh a little more than a vignette but but kind of encapsulated like that um do you think that way when you're writing shorts uh or kind of what's your approach to it well yeah i mean the from a craft perspective when i write a short story the the thing that it does for me is is it forces me to focus i've got a finite amount of words which you do in a novel as well but 
it, it's really easy to, to tell that to George R. R. Martin. <laughs> Joe, well, or Stephen King. Let's let's do a revised yeah. edition with six hundred more pages. Why not? Uh, but anyway, um, it, it it makes me focus. Uh, it forces me to focus on the character, which is what I like to do anyway. And um, it, it I've got a finite amount of words. I can only write so much, and it keeps me from getting bloated in the storytelling, which it's really easy to do. Um, whenever I'm writing or editing someone else's story, I always try to put myself in the shoes of the reader. Uh, if I'm if I'm suggesting that you change, you know, a word here or or a word there, it's not because I think my word's better than yours. It's because I think the reader will have an easier time assimilating the story or taking in the story um, with the, with my suggestion. So. I always like to, uh, with short stories, for example, uh, character comes first, which is true of longer fiction as well. But for me, but um, uh, it's 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 always focused, and I, I don't want to say um, economical or efficient because that sounds too uh, machine like. Um, but uh, it's it's always it's always uh, uh, targeted at at a particular. I, I subscribe to Fo's, Poe's philosophy of composition, so it's got to be focused on a particular emotional um, reaction that I'm trying to get from the reader. And everything in the story, from format to character to word choice to imagery to theme to motif, whatever, all of that is aimed at the, at getting that particular emotional reaction from the reader. Uh, Kevin, what about you? Is your creative process different uh, when you approach a, a short work, either a short story or novella, uh, as opposed to one of your novels? And uh, is your planning process different? It, I mean, I'm just thinking about it, and it really is different because I'm, in fact, I, I'm often at writers' workshops and stuff, and I'm, I'm mocking the pantsers. I think that's like building the building a, a house without drawing a blueprint. You don't just put up walls and hope they fit together. And and I so I, I kind of tease people that don't plot ahead of time and they don't plan ahead of time and they don't outline because my novels are like I said, they're doorstops. They're they're ninety nine chapters long. They're thirty five main characters. There there's so much stuff that I have to plan and choreograph and get everything down. But for a short story, which I'm going to write in a day or two days at most, I kind of get the idea and I usually put a little one line, scene one is this, scene two is this, scene three is this, and there's usually not more than three or four scenes in a short story. So I just sort of look at it and go, all right, I got it. And then I just go out and wing it. And I, again, with my recorder, I'll go out and walking and I'll just dictate the story and I'll go. So I'm, I'm much I'm able to hold an entire short story in my head during the process of downloading it into words. Whereas a novel, I've got to have that blueprint so I know where the plumbing goes and where the structural walls go and where the roof goes and everything else. So um, I guess it is pretty different for a short story and it's, it's liberating, but I sure as heck wouldn't want to do an 800 page novel that way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the, the collection is called Bridge Across the Stars, a sci-fi bridge original anthology. Uh, this amazing forward by Kevin J. Anderson uh, that really sets the tone uh, for this collection of, of, of science fiction stories that really harken back to uh, the things that we love about science fiction. Uh, this is an amazing collection, guys. Uh, Kevin, Chris... Uh, Jason and Rhett, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we're going to send everybody to pick up a copy of Bridge Across the Stars and also go to Sci-Fi Bridge uh, to sign up so that you uh, don't miss uh, anything coming out uh, from Sci-Fi Bridge. Anything uh, you guys would like to say before we uh, before we go? You know, I would say just a thank you to Kevin for writing that forward. I know for him it's a, it's, it's a 10-minute drive, right? But for, for authors like me, yeah. <laughs> who, who sat down clutching one of his paperbacks as a kid and saying, someday I want to do this, to see your name there with Kevin's name and for him to take the time, um, it's, it's, a, it's a generational thing. Um, just like the people before were looking at guys like uh, Bradbury, it, it's really amazing. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity to see these generations of sci-fi writers kind of continuing on and never getting so big that they say, uh, oh, well. Right. So it means a lot, not only just because it was a great forward, but it means a lot to, I think, the authors who are writing to say, you know, I, I'm part of a tradition that's important. So thanks, Kevin, for doing that. Well, and I, I think as writers, science fiction writers in particular, we don't 
we still think of ourselves as fanboys. I mean, I'm still this this geeky. I'll, I'll go on Twitter and talk about. It. We just watched the Punisher last night, and everybody will. <laughs> or and 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 I still go. I'm now a guest when I go, and they they pay my badge in my hotel room and stuff. But I still go to Cincinnati Comic Con and Dallas Comic Con and and Phoenix Comic Con and and I'm I'm marvel at the cosplay and I look at the comics and I read the books and meet the authors and and I'm I, I don't feel like there's this master servant thing. I feel that we're all um, paying it forward. I mean, I had I I didn't talk about this, but my People who helped me out when I was just this little nobody starting out with a couple of short stories published. And I'm not kidding. Dean Kuntz and Terry Brooks took me under their wing and helped me become a writer. So, I mean, I was a nobody and they still did that. So how can I not help other people when I'm, I'm um, more successful now? So I like paying it forward. Yeah. I'm with Jason on that. Thanks, and I'm probably from a generation below him and Chris as well. So, oh yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, extra. He's way below me in the generation. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's extra cool for me. <laughs> right. Behind yeah, I phrase say. before your time with Rhett yeah. a lot. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if I've read a print book. Yeah, did you know Reagan was president in the '80s? By the way, we go back to Anderson's story. Was <laughs> that before your time? Huh? Uh, was before <laughs> before I was born. Yeah. <laughs> Rhett, when uh, when you reach drinking age, I'll, uh, I'll I'll raise a glass to you for this collection. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for coming on the show today. All right, thank, thank you. you. Have yeah. thing. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane series. He was just seven when his parents died. Eliza received the news of their death on Halloween morning, but she kept it from Jason for two more days. She sent him out trick-or-treating. He was a vampire. He spun around in the living room, eyes wild, shouting, I am the living dead! and wondering why they didn't laugh. On November 2nd, after school, Eliza told him. His parents were dead. It was a bleak time, he wanted silence. He wanted darkness. He cried great, rolling tears. In early spring, he ran away from home, which means he stole five dollars, put a box of Cheez-Its in a pillowcase, and walked seven blocks. He slept in a field, glad to be miserable. He wanted to freeze to death, to be with his mom and dad, to not feel anything. His grandmother found him at a playground near the river fallen in the dust with his shoulder against the slope of a teeter-totter, the other end riderless, suspended. He saw her trudging up the hill. She looked twice her usual size in her winter coat, and frightening. Let's go home, Jason. He knew he was in trouble. He knew what home meant. It meant a paddling or worse. Eliza opened her big winter coat and, straining, slipped down into the dust next to him. She drew him into her warm body wrapping him in the coat. She flipped the collar up, rubbed her hands together, and cupped them over his ears. Burr, you're an ice cube, but it feels good, kinda. It's good to get really cold sometimes. Wakes you up. They were cheek to cheek against the teeter-totter, bundled together as the sky turned from gray to orange. The ground stung, but they sat a long time. Why? The word was just a tiny puff of vapor that slipped from his lips and into the wind. But it was also big. Big and heavy. She knew what his little boy heart had asked. She understood the universe of longing and confusion and hurt in that one whispered word. We all die, baby. In all the long, long history of the world, there's not been one of us who didn't. I'll die, he said. It wasn't a question, but it was. Yes, and I'll die. A lot sooner. And the why is just... It's just there. It just is. We're not around to see what was before us, and we're not here to see what happens after. 
The trees on the edge of the playground shivered with dawn. But we're here now, she said, and pulled him tighter until his cheekbone felt sore from pressing against hers. And it has to be enough. It has to be. Look at all we have now. Really look. He really looked. It was just a small playground off the main road of an unimportant New England town. But in the distance he could see the wide Kennebec River, and the sky was pink above it. He saw small ships moored, trimmed in red and baby blue, rocking against the current. He saw a robin on the railing of a dock, toes pointed inward, making occasional hops that were also flight. The town was waking up. There was a light in the bakery and one in the grocery. There was an empty can of beer on a picnic table and wildflowers by the road. There was wind and trees swaying gently. There was his own breath in his own lungs. There was his grandmother, her body, her heartbeat against his back as he leaned against her chest. There was his own life and hers and a world to live them in. And it was enough.